Hello. My name is Brendan McLeod, and this is Oathsworn, an actual play podcast where my friends Devin, Gavin, Chris, Matthew, and I play a campaign of Band of Blades. I wanted to start this episode with a short intro about what these first couple of episodes are like, in part because we spend them playing a different game than Band of Blades, and in part because I don't do a very good job explaining the rules or what it is that we're doing in those first two episodes. So, this is the first of two world-building episodes where we play a game called The Ground Itself by Everest Pipkin. The Ground Itself is a game about telling the story of a particular place over time. We play it to create the world that our campaign will take place in. Band of Blades has a world of its own that you can use for your own campaign, but we decided we wanted to come up with something of our own. We also talk a fair bit at the very start about what kind of a story it is that we want to tell, especially within the framework of the grimdark genre that Band of Blades occupies. If you're really interested in getting to the action of Band of Blades, you can skip ahead to episode one, where we play the very first mission of the campaign. You can probably infer a lot of what it is that we come up with in these episodes just by listening to that. But if you're interested in hearing us play the ground itself, build up the bones of the world, and maybe get a sense of what we're like as players, then I'll get out of the way and let you get to the episode. Thanks. So before we get into like stuff, um, first of all, I'm super excited to play. I'm really, really glad that everyone has um, agreed to to put this together. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Mm -hmm. I obviously have played with all of you, and so I feel confident just jumping straight in. But I don't know if anyone here has not played something, whether in Roll Plus Bond or elsewhere with other people. So I thought, you know, we should take just a second to like introduce ourselves to each other just to double check, like if, if there are those gaps or if there's fond memories of games played. Um, (laughs) um, Also, you know, just to make sure everyone knows what to call one another. I'm Brendan. I use he, him pronouns. I am the one that organized it. So I've played stuff with all of you. Um, I think most recently, what, I'm in campaigns with at least two of you, and then I just finished so that someday you might know the truth with Chris, which was absolutely amazing. Devin, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. I'm Devin. I use he, him pronouns. I think I played with everybody except for Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think the odd one out here. Oh, no. <laughs> Wait, what where did, where did we play together? Uh, we played Spire. Oh, yeah. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, oh, that was with, a good game. With Wiki, with Kirwiki. Oh, am I supposed to say anything else? Uh, uh, favorite color? Favorite? Uh, what is your favorite color? Uh, I don't know. Purple. All right, I'll accept it. No, that's that's great. Gavin, do you want to go next? Sure. My name's Gavin. I use he/him pronouns. Yeah, I, I haven't played a game with Matt either, or Matthew. Which mm-hmm. do you prefer? Um, I like Matthew just because I've known a lot of asshole Matts. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Uh, I haven't played a game with Matthew either. Cool. I'm glad but that I, I've I arranged this situation where we can all just. <laughs> <laughs> and I get to go with uh, us as well. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. Um, real quick, Gavin, you have the most experience with Band of Blades uh, out of all of us, I think, right? Yeah. One whole session. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I got excited about the game from talking with you about it. So. Yeah, it, it was a cool idea for a campaign. It all fell apart after one session. Cool. Well, I realize now that maybe invoking the specter of that game was also a bad <laughs> idea. So l- I'm just well, on a roll. I mean, it uh, it fell apart because of COVID more than anything else. So Fair. The game was good. The people were good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Chris. 
Yeah, I'm Chris. She, any pronouns. Like everyone here but Brendan, I've played a game with everyone here but Matthew. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, nice to meet you also. Hi. Outstanding. Yeah. Good to meet you all, uh, except for Brendan. Yeah, hi, I'm Matthew, <laughs> he, him pronouns. I've played one one-shot, two one-shots with Brendan in the, the Role Plus Bond, I think. And then uh, Brendan and I have an ongoing Beam Saber campaign that I uh, GM, which is quite good, I think. I like it a lot. I think it's good. Cool. So we're going to get into Band of Blades, which as we've gone over, but just to say it out loud, is a game about the Legion, our uh, military organization, fighting a retreating battle away from dark forces that are sweeping the continent of this fantasy world. It is a game about the organization more than it is a game about individual people, although certainly we'll see the lives and the successes and failures of individual people. But that will be in service to the story about this ensemble, about what it is that this organization tries to do as we are on the run trying to figure out what it is that we can do to hold out against this strange alien force that is uh, nipping at our heels. Well, it's a, it's a lot more than nipping at our heels. Uh, yeah, it's actively absolutely. winning. Good point. Good point. Like th- this is not a, a fight where we can win. This is this entire campaign is an escape. Yeah, this this campaign is. The, the the great battle against evil was fought and we lost and now we're running away. In the core book, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about the history of the world that is fleshed out in some detail or another, usually enough to like tease out what is interesting about um, different groups or different areas, even if they're not on screen. And then... About 10 years ago, or maybe exactly 10 years ago, this dark figure, the Cinder King, rose in the far west and began conquering territory, using mystical powers to conquer cities and convert their population to his dark army. And then most horrifyingly, breaking the chosen, the agents of the gods plucked from the uh, faithful mortals and sent against him only to be um, smashed by his mysterious power and often converted to his own army. So we are going to create our own world. We're going to create our own um, circumstances wherein we've got a situation like that. Certain details will almost certainly be pretty different. But what we know to be true is that there is a dark power within the world that is is swallowing up the realms of mortals that we are on the run from, that we have had only the slightest bit of success ever against it by virtue of incredible sacrifice, tremendous um, production of um, artillery and uh, relics and stuff like that. And even after all of that, we are still losing. We are still escaping. We're not going to create the entire world here today. We're going to focus on the region of the world where our army is escaping, where we are traipsing across the uh, countryside, trying to traipsing is probably the wrong word, (laughs) trying to escape across the countryside, frolicking, uh, frolicking, (laughs) frolicking, as we um, not only try and evade the forces of the army that is sweeping across, but also try and find whatever relics, whatever supplies, whatever reinforcements we could find as we go so we can make one last desperate stand before the winter comes. Uh, If you join Roll20, this is sort of a a very rough re-representation of the map as it appears in Band of Blades. This can change. Um, We're probably going to be going from one direction to the other. We need to have room for separate uh, paths and stuff like that. But... If we decide, hey, there's a big lake here, or actually the sea is a bigger feature here than otherwise um, realized, then that's uh, stuff that we can decide as we play and fill in. Um, Any thoughts, any questions, any unclear details thus far? I did say previously that I wanted to 
wax poetic slash rant about grimdark and like genre for a bit, mm-hmm. when would be a good time to do that? Like you could do that right <laughs> like now? now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. If you're comfortable so, with it now, sure. Yes. I, I've read a lot of it. Some of it's really bad and some of it's pretty good. The good grimdark um, and that I'd like for us to decide whether or not we want to exist metaphysically, I guess, um, or narratively, are these uh, main tenets. Grimdark is about success not meaning the end of a struggle, but the change of that struggle to something you're more comfortable with, to something uh, that's easier to deal with. It doesn't punish hope, it punishes naivety. And uh, it's always hopeful in the end, despite punishing naivety. So those are like the big three things that make good grimdark good. Or, or that are that are aspects of good grimdark, not necessarily that make it good. I think all that seems pretty reasonable to me. I think um, I, I'm on board with with all that. And then zooming out a little further, this kind of isn't related to grimdark, but I would like it if we as player characters are more in materialist is is a weird way to say it, but that's the the right word philosoph- philosophically. Like, mm-hmm. uh, our characters are in the material world. We don't have magic. We don't have this idea that ideas exist. But the gods may have a immaterial world um, where they interact with us. But, like, everything that we do from alchemy to everything else that we do is rooted within the material world and limited by the material world chosen and gods can break that but we're not any of those is that more yeah. almost like a call to action of like style and yeah and, and visual it, it, callbacks like like if we describe a person doing a thing even within the confines of the rule set we should be conscious of what a material person should be able to do as opposed to like an anime character yeah Um, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I think so. So like, it's definitely, there are no Gokus, like even the chosen aren't on Goku's level. (laughs) Damn it. Uh, Goku will not save you. In my notes, in my notes, I had a Goku type written down. Fuck. (laughs) No, you could have a Goku type. Who's like masks from, um, uh, bluff city. You know, that kid who's like, you want to see me go super Saiyan. But now he's 23 and he still hasn't gone Super Saiyan. Yeah. And he's and wondering. He's mediocre yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. again, remember, uh, good Grimdark punishes naivety, but not hopefulness. So if your character is steadfast in this idea that they are going to become Super Saiyan, they're going to keep getting punished for that. But not because of their hopefulness towards, you know, saving whoever or doing whatever, but because... Um, they have to come to terms with the fact that they'll never be Goku and they have to uh, understand what they're actually capable of. And then they'll finally be rewarded, etc. It's funny. I think, I don't think this is deliberate, but it is funny that Goku is the go-to example here because Goku, like obviously the ability level of Goku is not on, on the table, I think is what we're saying. But Uh, Goku in particular, I think, is an interesting example because Goku is all about, um, regardless of where he is at his personal journey, um, in order to do what it is that I, the the things that I do, I have to train and I have to be good at what it is that I'm doing. He doesn't have the natural endowment of like a Superman character of like, well, I was just born with the ability to absorb the rays of the yellow sun. So I get to look like this and do this. Goku puts in the hours and that's why he's able to do the things that he does. And so I think it's Goku is, I can't believe how many times I've said Goku in the past, seven years, <laughs> but I think the actually Goku cast. there's, there's an interesting idea there of like a character who is like, has heard of a legend of a chosen in the vein of a Goku and knows in their heart of hearts that they'll probably never be as strong as a Goku, but they're going to follow in that example and like train whenever they possibly can in order to like live up to that example of like, 
if they are going to be strong enough to be to be able to protect other people, then that requires vigilance and training. And so they're going to do that to achieve whatever they can within their own lives, which seems like in the vein of the kind of story we're hoping to tell. Am I am I right about that? Yeah. Uh, well, the reason I brought up Goku was because the tropes talk YouTube people, red and blue or whatever they're called. Mm-hmm. They use Goku as the example. Like, if I want to watch something where I feel hopeful, I'm going to watch Goku defeat Frieza. When I watch Goku defeat Frieza, I see someone who can never exist uh, defeating the ultimate evil. Gotcha. And, like, the the main thesis about Grimdark is, like, there is no Goku to save you. You must save you. You right. have to defeat Frieza. Yeah. And you don't get to go Super Saiyan to do it. Mm-hmm. But you still have to defeat Frieza. Cool. Uh, right. So now that we've talked about Goku for about an hour. <laughs> one, one more thought. One more Goku thought. Um, yes, well, please. Goku also, also, a common thing that happens in, in Dragon Ball Z is that Goku fucking dies. And people have to keep fighting without him. The, the, maybe whatever god that was granting these powers like isn't even really accessible to us anymore. It's just the, yes. the Chosen trying to hold on to some sort of dying flame of, of, of that power. Sure. Oh, like the gods are abandoning the chosen too. I yeah. like that. Yeah, the idea. I like that idea a lot. Of like a chosen realizing that they are like the last vestige of whatever that particular god is in this world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That kind of puts an interesting onus on them to like not get broken, right? Hey, a lot of this is great, but it feels like we're playing the game before we play the game. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think. These are some good thoughts to, to get out, but we should um, get to playing if we can. So um, the one thing that I did also want to talk about before immediately after saying we should play the game, the one thing that I want to talk <laughs> about before playing the game is that Ground Itself, which is a game about places over time, gives you a little bit of flexibility about what the timeline of the game is. When you're typically playing the game, you roll a d6, and that affects like whether the entire game happens over days, weeks, years, decades, centuries, or millennia. I thought maybe it might make more sense for us to just sort of talk through what we think the most reasonable sort of thing might be. Again, in the core book, this sort of unstoppable evil began to rise 10 years ago. I could really easily see this being a game where we talk about like the interim 10 years of our world, but I was curious to know what everyone thought. Well, the other option would be to do the opposite of that and talk about millennia and talk about the gods that founded this world and why the world is the way it is and Absolutely. where this conflict yeah. came from. Yeah. I do want to make These sure we focus be on old. this, this yeah. region of the world, though. So we can definitely define stuff like that, but we should define it in the context of this region that we're, that we're creating. The cities could be real old. Yeah, 100%. They, they can and should be, I think. Um, regardless of what our time frame is, people should absolutely be free to, or feel free to say like, this city has been here for hundreds of years, or this, this city was a ruin, even when these people moved in or something like that, that kind of thing. I'm cool with just rolling the die and seeing how it shakes out. It does sound like we're trending towards longer spans of time. So we get days and I'm going to be like, oh boy. <laughs> I, I've got ideas for days. I mean, it could absolutely be like the days of the battle that we're about to escape from. That's absolutely a thing that it could be, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, then in that case, why don't we just go ahead and get started and uh, let's start by rolling the die. Who wants to roll a d6 to get us started? I'll do it. (laughs) Do it. (laughs) I dare you. All right. Two. I get a two. Are we not going to do the establishing our place with the face cards first? Great. Well, no, I think that comes next. Okay. Yes. Sorry. I was skipping. So um, I've skipped over getting started. Mm. I've also skipped over our setting since we just talked about our setting for like half an Mm -hmm. hour. And then I'm on our timeline. The game is played in four cycles. Each cycle is separated by a gap in time. One player rolls the six sided die and records the result. I rolled a right. two, which is weeks. How do we feel about weeks? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're telling a story in weeks about this place in the world. 
Um, and I will read the next section, which is establishing our place. Each player is dealt cards from the face cards stack in a circle until no cards are left. Then going in the same circle, each player sets down one card at a time and answers the question associated with that card detailed below. You may read the cards first or pick between their cards at random. Keep going until the wheel world feels established or each player is out of cards, whichever happens first. Try to keep this discussion under 25 minutes. Keep your answers <laughs> to each question very short and free of Goku's. You may wish to make brief notes to jog your memory later. So I have the face cards here. There are... We can just go through in Discord order? Yeah, why don't we do that? Does that mean I go first? Is that what's happening here? Sure, you're the GM. Sure. Okay, I'm going to draw a card from the black deck, which is the face cards. I got the King of Diamonds. King of Diamonds is who or what is in power here? Is it a ruler, an apex predator, a series of laws that govern society, the weather? Um. Okay, I think... It's a really big decision to make right off the bat. It is. But you know what? That's the way it goes. Um, I that's had, why I wanted you to go first. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, I think this is a Senate situation. Okay. I think this is the kind of place where there's a local senator who is probably a noble of some kind, but maybe isn't necessarily always, who gets sent to a central deliberating body. Mm. Does each city have their own senator? I think each city has a couple of senators. Mm -hmm. And do they meet at some sort of like cool temple that is like has a history with the gods, but like yeah, maybe not anymore. Um, In Geneva, <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably like I think they probably arrive at a place that was once regarded as like sacrosanct but is now like a lot of crowded villas and apartments and stuff like that. Instead of Geneva, we can call it Vegeta. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Technically uh, not a Goku, I guess. Technically we'll not pass. a Goku. Yeah. I, I guess a grim dark Dragon Ball Z would be Vegeta has to defeat Frieza. <laughs> the, there was a, there's like a spinoff. Monk. This is not. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry to bring it back oh onto the God. Goku train. <laughs> There's... No, I was against the Goku train. Welcome to the Goku train. Vegeta, who I actually like. Uh. <laughs> anyway, is that the one where he has an M on his forehead? Yeah. Um, well, uh, this is. There's more than one country here, right? Cities no. can be city states. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is like a confederation of city states, and like there's definitely regionality to it. And maybe like even some groups of cities are known for not even participating in in the senate senatorial system quite as much as the others cool what's that period of german history where like it's all just like merchant kingdoms great question like uh, right before von bismarck yeah hanseatic league hanseatic league Ooh. do we think do we like the league for the name of this governing ballot body I think once we figure out the name of this place, uh, it'll be that, the Blank League for now. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Or the League of Blank. Or is there mm -hmm. something even more like eldritch and archaic than League? All these are baseball words. <laughs> the Goku Confederacy. Uh, the Goku Confederacy. The Soviet of Gokus. <laughs> mm. Goku Consortium. The, the Goku, Goku Consortium is extremely good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any and all names could be decided later. For now, we know there's like a Senate. Yeah, TBD, TBD, TBD. Maybe we, TBD. Can, maybe we can change it around to the Kogu. <laughs> mm. I, hate right. this. I hate this game. Mm. Mm -hmm. Devin, it's your turn. Please draw. Can you draw a card? Do you have the ability to draw cards? Uh, let's find out. Queen of Hearts. The Queen of Hearts says... Who or what a person, landmark, or society has been in this place the longest? How did they come to be here? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good one. I can I can go as, as as big and weird as I want on this, right? Absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna say the sky is a corpse of a god. Oh shit. 
Hell yeah. And I don't know if this is necessarily the god that whoever the uh, force that's terrorizing this land is drawing its power from, but it certainly is one of them. Now, when you say the sky is a corpse, is there like what we would think of as corpse-like elements up there? I mean, it's 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 god shit, so it's like immaterial stuff. The way we think about a corpse being this rotting thing that decays over time versus what a corpse is of a god is probably distinctly different. Because gods use yeah. stars, but they're mushrooms. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe. Is it like maybe the stars like grow over time? Like there's more stars in the sky every year, and that's ooh, that's part of ooh. the god's decay. God. So is it is that like just here or like other places? Or I guess are there places where the sky is not god corpse? I mean, I think it'd be cool. Like we're 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 working in a pretty like low tech setting, right? Yeah. Totally. Like maybe not all of the world is known to us. Like maybe we know the like continent mm-hmm. that we're on and beyond that it's just you know dark sky we can't really see past it so we don't know if we're on a sphere or a a, a plane or of the section we know it's just like that's the god corpse sky like what else is there yeah so mm-hmm. there, could, there could be all kinds of stuff going on that we don't know about and i think that gives us some uh room to be <laughs> vague about the cosmology here <laughs> yeah 100 mm-hmm. percent love the idea of a conspiracy just like there are parts of the sky where it's like green or something shut up dave yeah i mean uh, mm-hmm. uh y'all were posting some kingdom arts stuff in chat earlier <laughs> what if like sometimes entities drip down from the sky and are like parts of yes. the sky itself Ooh. that are like hostile or maybe just inscrutable yes yeah i almost imagine there being like because it would also be kind of interesting if there is like this juxtaposition between these sort of gritty normal humans with their pistols and their their swords and then just this world that is very strange um and and unexpected in in ways that we as you know human beings on earth wouldn't be used to but maybe these people absolutely are. but this is the oldest thing here this is all that these people know mm-hmm. the death of the god cool. created the, the the people that live here yeah yeah this that thing's always been dead as far as like do we do we perceive it as dead or is it It, well i i imagine it's maybe even way more complicated than saying that it's just dead but like that's maybe kind of the logic of the priests or the people that have you know told these stories yeah okay that's cool i imagine when the gods were still talking to us they mentioned that oh yeah this one's dead yeah (laughs) but it's not like we can move the corpse because it's the sky like (laughs) we we just wouldn't have a sky then (laughs) Good point. Or it's like we asked it to move. We asked a god to move it, and the god was like, "Why? <laughs> what, what for? What purpose?" It's not like it's starting to smell or anything. Awesome, Gavin. Oh. Do you want to draw a card? Okay, King of Spades. If there are multiple people who live here, what are they divided on? What are the points of contention that are fought over? I think they're divided on. I'm not going to actually, what if they weren't divided geographically like the base game, but they were divided by what gods they cared about. Mm. Yeah. Cared about in what sense? Well, worship probably is the correct word, but. Having different teams or particular players. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, we talked about the the chosen being like vestiges of like gods that are gone. Like maybe that's all there is left of the gods. So you have to be near the chosen to be able to worship them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
you know, the chosen don't have to necessarily get along. So maybe they, uh, they have, uh, disputes and people rally behind certain chosen based on those disputes mm. um, and based on what benefits them the best. That seems like that would lead to some easy paths to being broken. Like, you know, Chosen of the Healing God is probably pretty pretty high up there. A lot of people need healing all the time. Are they divided in the sense of, like, this is what our, our nation or our group of nations should be devoted to? Like, is there is there a higher level above and beyond personal devotion? Yeah, I think people can live all over and worship the same God. Like, I'm imagining this is a pretty migratory or pretty well-traveled area. So, you know, there there might be temples, you know, in each city devoted to whatever gods are around. Mm-hmm. The size of those temples depends on, you know, the people who, the residents there, what they actually care about. Cool. Yeah. I think people are divided so much so that they name their culture around whatever god or gods that they care about the most. Awesome. Chris. King of Clubs is, if there are inhabitants, what are the visions for the future that they hold? Is it a long view? Is it a short one? Um, (laughs) I guess this goes back to that question of, like, hope versus naivete. Um... There's got to be people who are just like, yeah, they're going to, like, kick the Cinder King's ass. And then there's people like, Abs- absolutely not. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, this might also depend on people who are more devoted to the different chosen or the different gods have different ideas of what the what the future look like. Yeah, I think inherently the conversation about, like, this is the virtue and ideal and the divinity that we should be devoted to, that we should be concerned with, is fundamentally an argument about, and here's the direction we as a, as yeah. a, as a land should take. Yeah. Particularly in the face of, like, this overwhelming destructive power. It suddenly becomes a pertinent question. I do think, though, like, if if things are so... You know, like if this is a game about escape rather than defeating the enemy, then like I wonder mm-hmm. if that would lead people to trend more towards a, sh- a short term future of just like this is this is the sort of scale of future that we're most concerned with. Like we just want to survive this versus, mm-hmm. you know, a longer future of like. Yeah, we want to, you know, once once the Cinder King is dealt with or whatever, <laughs> then we'll like build up a glorious future. Like I don't. I, 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 I would imagine people are trending more towards the like, here's the next step, or here's like maybe two steps ahead as opposed to like ten. Maybe there's a church associated with that, and it's less a church yeah. to like a god, but a church to the future. Yeah. Oh man. The god of foresight is already dead. <laughs> <laughs> For real? In the set? Okay. But their church? No, no, no. I, I'm just saying, like the, like this church could have be like to a god of foresight who is dead. Mm, I like that. <laughs> Couldn't foresee its own future yet is still worshipped. Well, maybe it's like a, a, a foundation, like Isaac Asimov foundation, where there's like a guy who predicted all of the future and then just like left behind this like cryptic like lore document for people to interpret and it ends up shaping society a lot. Maybe there is like... Yeah, scripture that people like. Oh well, this is that, and and if you look at it like sideways and with (laughs) only one eye open, then this is that thing. So clearly, clearly, this person in these texts represents you know this chosen and something. (laughs) And that could be a huge source of naivete. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, like yeah, but these also describe the sky as being like blue and full of whatever a cloud is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Listen, um, but yeah, I, I, I like the idea that for the most part, people are are more concerned with a short term or a shorter term view of the future because, you know, most people are just people, uh, and so that is like what they can deal with right now. It's it's like what they can work on, and then you've got yeah the the 
Foresight Church yeah. just being like, one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think particularly after the past year and a half, I think we've definitely seen like how much of a struggle it can be just to like think about like the next day. <laughs> yeah. Probably there's a lot of that. And w- which would lead people to like really look askance at people that are like, when all this is over, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you talking about? That's cr- what? Matthew. What's up? It's time. It's happening. It's happening. Watch out. It's the King of Hearts. Okay. King of Hearts. What stories are told in or about this place? Does it have legends or myths? Does it have religion? Hmm. Well, some of this is certainly already answered. Mm -hmm. Has none of these. Next question. Yeah, yeah. Actually, surprise. Twist. Okay, so we know that the Senate is what really is holding power here, despite all these churches being about. We know that the corpse of the god is up in there in the sky. Devin, you mentioned that at night there's like stars and there's more stars over time and who knows what's going to happen with that. Uh, do we have like a day-night cycle? Uh, <laughs> we have a stars, no stars cycle. Okay, so, but is it still just like otherwise it's the same color or colors? Yeah, maybe like it... Okay. I mean, if, if, if we're going to lead into the, the grim here and it being a corpse, maybe it's like lots of neutral colors, but like it does shift mm-hmm. and it does like swirl sometimes. Mm-hmm. I could see like two eyes being the sun Yo. or the sun's Ooh. or maybe an open mouth. What if it used to have two suns, but one of them has burned out? Ooh. Is that cool with you, Devin? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this cosmology already is like nonsense, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So oh, yeah. We, have, we have a a quote-unquote night with stars, and then we have a quote-unquote day with used to be two suns, now one sun. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's a very weak red sun. F- uh, mm-hmm. okay, All right, good. Mr. So science, sun. Mr. <laughs> Dr. Science. <laughs> and then from Gavin, we have that people fight over their favorite chosen, whatever their chosen's current like campaign is. And then from Chris, we have everybody's focused on sort of short-term futures. So then what legends or stories well obviously we have legends that seems fairly implicit and obviously we have a religion Mm -hmm. i think that i actually want to get specific to the place now Mm -hmm. like actually what's on land here brendan how are you imagining that people were going to like start marking up this map i think um if people either want to like copy paste stuff in or draw stuff i'm good with either of that okay I don't know if I necessarily have a change from this particular thing or a visualization from this particular sure. thing, but um, I think that there are a lot of legends, stories, religions, etc. Obviously, we know there's lots of religions, um, but I think that those things are deeply intertwined. So I think that you know we have these sort of nations that name themselves after gods. Everybody's big godheads. Everybody loves gods. Mm-hmm. Always wrapping their favorite god here, their favorite chosen. Um, And I think that everybody has very different, like every faith has very different beliefs around particular legends or stories. Yeah, as Chris says in the chat, which chosen do you stand? Mm -hmm. You have to do a, it's a a quiz you take, which chosen are you? (laughs) Um, uh, But yeah, every, every faith has a different story about how various things came to be. So like, the sky, for example, mm-hmm. different faiths have different. Everybody knows, yeah, it's a corpse of a dead god. Obviously, just look at it, right? Right. Straightforward. But what's unclear and, and what people argue about in part is uh, how that god died. Who was that god? What was up with that god? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a good or a bad thing that said god is dead. Right. People argue about, you know, the land itself. Where did that come from? That there's legends, tons and tons of legends about where the ground came from, where the waters came from where the creatures came from, where the Cinder King came from. But I think that there's no, like, one through line in terms of one consistent notion of history here. Cool. I like that. Uh, There's a book called Range of Ghosts that has a bunch of different cultures across, like, a Russia-sized area. And each god, each religion in turn, says that their god defeated the the big bad (laughs) evil guy Mm -hmm. from... Way, but way back. Awesome. Okay. I'll draw another card. Queen of Clubs. Queen of Clubs. What was the greatest moment in this place's history? An innovation? A discovery? A revolution? A new sapling? Interesting. 
I think that I think the world used to be like hundreds and hundreds of years ago, much more feudal and much more chaotic and much more dominated by tyrants. I think in particular, there was a given tyrant or the last in a long line of tyrants that ruled from this, uh, from this place. I think, you know, depending on the story, people will tell you that it was either just a a warlord that had amassed tremendous uh, force of arms and wealth or had mystical powers or something. But the, the claim to fame is that the people of this realm rose up and struck him down and established this Senate thing to, to take over in its place. And what really happened is a lot of the territory that this person had was accountable for sort of split off on their own and became their own sort of entities. But this, this region has sort of maintained the claim to fame of like, we, (laughs) we, we set the people free and we established the rule of the people by, by forming this league in place of being dominated by a tyrant. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think probably wherever their meeting place is, is in the old capital Uh, Mm. probably has like ruined, um, ruined palaces and stuff like that. That feels like that could go on the map. Yeah. Let me draw something. Um, Devin, do you want to go? All right. I got the Jack of hearts. Who lives here? What is the average person like in this place? What do they look like? What do they wear? Uh, I'm going to need some help here. <laughs> nope. Please establish all of the culture of the world and do it right now. Yeah. So, well, if you turn to, if you turn to band of blades page, uh, no, just read from the book. <laughs> I love this game, but the book is in the trash. So we're going to do this ourselves. All right. Um, let's see. Who lives here? Well, uh, uh, we'd, we've talked a little bit beforehand about like the types of people we want to see in the world. But I think all we really came up with was there are like normal humans and then there are people with horns. I think we know more than that, right? Yeah. Gavin had a specific through line of even if there are people with horns, they are not not humans. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's so, like That was like an environmental yeah. change that they experienced because of where they were from, right? Yeah. yeah. Like Either environmental thing. change or influence from proximity to a god yeah okay or a funny chosen that they stand yeah Mm -hmm. so in that case are there any like normal humans as we would think of humans or are they all humans that have been influenced based off of the the chosen i think there's probably quote-unquote normal people by virtue of the fact that not everyone stays in the same place or yeah lives the same life maybe um, it's like based off of like proximity to chosen yeah and Mm. chosen chosen and gods are rare yeah like you know people still align based on them but like actually being able to be near one for long enough may be harder than yeah maybe a bit not like uncommon but not common either cool plus Um, who knows if that's really true right that's probably a story mm -hmm. that people tell (laughs) yeah so some people have horns um this is just a random thought but i just imagined a person with like tropical bird wings that sounds cool to me um mm-hmm. especially if it's like colorful wings and like a like a grim sort of background cool yeah and well i'll leave that vague enough that we can come up with stuff later for like what these sort of altered peoples could look like um and what the the variety is exactly so that kind of answers who lives here what is the average person like and what do they look like what do they wear hmm Here's, here's a question yeah. tying to, like, what is an average person like? Do you think that this is, like, like if you picked a random person from this nation, are they a farmer? Are they a, a miner? What, what do you think most people do? Um, I think a lot of that, at least in the modern era, has become, like, slightly irrelevant. People have the skills that they, they have that are beneficial to the war effort, but I think a lot of people have been kind of forced to be part of the war effort. And interesting like may- maybe there are farmers but maybe they're like mobile farmers maybe they have like a a wheelbarrow with some dirt in it that they grow some crops in oh interesting <laughs> okay um i don't know well you, there, there was such an emphasis on uh this is a story about people on the run so like 
Yeah, absolutely. Maybe a lot of those professions are only semi-relevant into how they can keep us alive during this crisis. I feel like a lot of like a lot of jobs that were maybe superficial to the literal health and and survival of people have become less like I mean people still probably like write poetry and write songs and make art and stuff like that, but like yeah, everything goes I get it. towards the war effort first. I real I realize now I was I was thinking about like what the people of this world are or at least this area are like independent of like the the army that's marching away because mm. like not not everyone that we encounter is part of the army or even was part of the battle or gotcha like that. it's like we're marching across this country because it happens to be where we need to run away gotcha lots of these places are probably still like populated with yeah and a lot of these places yeah. are gonna have to figure out how they're gonna stay uh-huh. there after we leave or come with us uh-huh okay yeah but i i, I do want to like I think that what Devin said is really interesting and I don't think it has to go entirely against like the mechanics of the game, right? Like think about world war two America yeah, where even small towns, right. Had drives for food for the troops. Nobody had, you know, rubber or nylons uh, at the time mm-hmm. because all of that was going to the front lines, right? There's ways in which the average person could have been enlisted to the war effort without the average person being a soldier. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a thought too. Like, what if like some of the cities that are like on the way that we know we might pass through, maybe they themselves have been like praying to the gods, knowing that there is this like force that is coming to rescue them or whatever. Or at least they they have a hope that huh. the army that is that is marching across this land will like sort of absorb them and, and carry them to safety. <laughs> um, and maybe like some of those those cities are like prepping for it. They're like making bullets. They're making swords. Like in the hopes that the army will come through and they can, you know, reasonably provide for the army to protect them. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm super into that. Draw that, draw that, uh, place. That's hopeful. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one place. There's only the one. Well, there's probably, you know, there's probably a mix. Well, there's probably more than one, but you know, draw me <laughs> <Yeah>. one, <laughs> but there's, yeah. there's, put, put there's almost certainly that. also cities that are just like full mask of red death. Right. Of just like, mm-hmm. We're going to lock the doors. We're going to open the wine and everything's going to be fine. The army can wait outside. The army's not coming in. In the base game, there is a city like that. And it is one of my favorite locations. Hell yeah. Uh, Gavin. Jack of Diamonds. What is the place named or called? I knew this would happen to me. <laughs> um, you who can, named you can it take for a second reason? if you need it. Mm-hmm. We already have some, some uh, ideas around yeah gavin do you want more time or do you want to draw another card we could all uh, we could also say we're gonna postpone the name of this as like a group decision and let you just draw another card i would be okay with that okay i, I i've got a name uh oh yeah cell shell l can you taste that in the chat somewhere um shell cell l is that what she said cell shell l Sell shall um, L. I'll, I'll paste the Hebrew letters and then the uh, the English transliteration. So this is the phrase meaning shadow of God. Mm. Ooh. Sell shall L. Do we... I mean, so I'm not opposed to it, but I do want us to be intentional about the idea of using or like a real world language to name their place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... So I'm Jewish. I like to use Hebrew for a lot of my stuff. I'm probably going to have Hebrew names for characters in this session or in this campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Sure. If we want to just decide, like, Hebrew is in this world. This world is completely different, but Hebrew is in it. I think that's totally fine. I just want it to be something that's, that we're doing intentionally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I enjoy bringing in languages from other cult, from, like, you know, outside English, if only to like, hmm, how to, I like having languages that don't sound like romance languages. Um, Sure. And, you know, Hebrew is easy because it is part of my heritage, but yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm on board with that. I think that's as I, I agree with Matthew. I think we can do that deliberately. Um, but I would encourage y'all to bring in languages that aren't English that are of your background. Mm, it's a good time. 
Yeah. Sel shall L. Sel shall L. Shadow of God. Mm-hmm. Cool. Is that the nation, the continent? Do you? I think that's the continent. Like any okay. anything mm-hmm. under the shadow of this dead god is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, is, this is that space. like because we only know of the continent? Is that just like our word for the world, basically? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris. Yerp. I got the Jack of Spades. Oh boy. What are the threats to this place? Are these threats <laughs> to the materiality of the place or the people that live in it? Uh, <laughs> mm. uh, yes. Both, probably. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. And. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So there's the, the big one of the Cinder King and all of the badness therein and about. Um, so I have a proposal there. I don't have a, like a name for what our big bad is, but I was thinking yeah. a bit about what our, and maybe I should just be letting you name all this stuff, but I thought of this, <laughs> so I'm going to say this anyway. We've talked a little bit about wanting to do something that is not zombies of stuff that is like having individuality and autonomy and selfhood, like driven out. Um, we've talked a little bit about this idea of like some sort of cosmic force kind of infecting people um, and maybe even like turning them into like these shadowy creatures. Mm -hmm. What do you think of calling these things the never? Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I don't hate that. That's pretty neat. Never in terms of what, I mean, like I guess there's a lot of ways that they could be never, but yeah. Because we'd also talked about, well, like whispers in your head that, that Mm -hmm. tell you things. I dig the, well, like, like you never have an answer. You never, like, there's never enough information there. Or you just, like, never quite get what you want. You're never done looking. You're never done asking. Mm -hmm. You're never done waiting for whatever you've been promised will happen Mm -hmm. to happen. Because, like, this threat is not just, wait, is the never... The, the the big big bad or is the never I think it's what it's turning the the individuals into like the the name for like the tide of of dark that's coming that never stops I mean I also enjoy any name for a thing that lets people talk about it in different ways just depending on the rest of the sentence around it right just depending on context it's just like they never stop or mm-hmm. they'll never get here like ah, don't say that is this a name? Is it, this is a name that we gave to them? I think that's probably true. Yeah. Okay. Because I I'm cool with I, what I wouldn't want. I it feels a bit like I don't mean this in the wrong way at all, but like it feels a bit like Disney Channel original movie. If <laughs> the Cinder King is like, aha, I'm the Nether. No. Yeah. Um, absolutely not. So yeah. Um. Yeah, cool. Cool. Just wanted to make sure, like. I, I don't think they have a name for themselves, mm-hmm. probably. No, they, um, yeah. Yeah, I was okay. going to say, because it, it, it sounds like a name that we had to give them because at some point they just, like, don't talk to you anymore. Okay, cool. Mm. And as Gavin said, they never stop. Yeah, oh, like, that's what what's I wrong said. with you? What right. are you doing? Why are you doing this? And they just, like, stop <laughs> answering. It's like, okay, they just never, like, this just keeps happening. It's always happening. They just never stop doing whatever the hell this is. Chris, what do you think the, how, how are these, how is this felt in the, apart from, you know, there's been war in, in places that is far away from this place. War has come to its doorstep, but is there like pockets of enemies that like spill over? How, how are these, how is this force felt in this place? I mean, aside from like the, you know, material damage of like, yeah, war is happening, and so like you have less stuff, or things get damaged, or people get hurt and killed. It's like also the- well, but but that's my question is like assume that like in the timeline of, of the adventure, the the army is like on the western border. It has not rolled over the country or anything like that. But are there still is there still stuff like that? Like how how is that manifest in in a place that is on the verge of war but is not quite there yet? I think, Chris, you gave the answer, which is that people are still being impacted because there's less stuff, right? The war may not be here, but they're still being impacted indirectly by the war. Yeah. And their chosen to, you know, normally hung out with them, have ridden out to fight this war, and some of them aren't coming back. Yeah, that makes sense. 
I think that what Brendan's larger question to you, Chris, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Brendan, but Brendan's larger question was like, okay, so whatever these things are, these non-zombie whatevers, the never, besides this like main war force, is there also like smaller bands of them that people sometimes encounter? Or is it just like, no, it's just on the war front that these never exist and they don't exist anywhere else? Yeah. Is it like a question of like, well, I've never <laughs> seen one of these in my <laughs> life. Or is there like a threat of them like suddenly manifesting in your own neighborhood or something like that? I mean, I think there's even if even if they don't appear, I think because once someone is a never or the never or doing the things that the never do, they stop talking or answering your questions like no one knows kind of how that happens to a person or there's no definite way of just like, ah, they're showing all of the symptoms of developing into this. So we need to do this, this and this to prevent it from happening. So there's like a sort of tension and fear that someone might. So I feel like people are just generally on edge. You know, how's your kid? Oh, I don't know. They're not talking to me much lately. Sometimes that's just like, okay, no, that's a teenager and they're just being a teenager. But there's always going to be that fear. It's just like, I do think that there's like a central point that's emitting this signal that is growing further and further away. Cause like, otherwise there's no reason for us to run because wherever we run to, it'll already be there. Sure. So I, I think there might be some wave or like maybe the broken, uh, amplify this signal or, that, or there's agents that, bring that, it too. that like sneak in and infect people. Yes. That. Yeah. What if also people, um, maybe, people oh, wouldn't know. Yeah. What if also people believe that it's associated with the stars appearing like these points of dark fall out of the sky and a star is formed and every time that happens another never hmm. is born i'm sure there's rumors about that yeah yeah when you wish upon a star <laughs> ever wish upon a star yeah if, <laughs> never if, wish uh, upon a star. If, if if every faith has um such divergent stories on a good day i'm sure they all have wildly different explanations for why all this is happening Oathsworn is an actual play podcast created by Devin Nelson, Gavin Frazier, Chris Allison, Matthew Govstyle, and me, Brendan McLeod. All music for the show is created by Devin Nelson. Find it and more at devindecibel.bandcamp.com. Find a link to their music in any of the games that we've played in the podcast description. Follow us at Oathsworn Pod on Twitter or Oathsworn on co-host. Until next time.